looking at the life of Samson. If you know anything about the life of Samson, God greatly used him, but he also greatly failed in some areas of his life. And here's why I want to preach about Samson. Now, first of all, I'm not going to preach all the details. It would take us a fourth and a fifth and a sixth um, message, if you will, because it's Judges 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 that are all of the details. Here's what I want you to understand about Samson. Here's why I'm preaching about Samson and the angle I'm coming at it from God's Word this morning. Revival for, for every one of us. And revival in its purest form is returning to God. Revival in its purest form is sort of returning to a state of where I used to be. Maybe it's going back to a day when I remember uh, I was fully in love with God and worship was just awesome. And right, it, Revival in its purest form is sort of returning back to a, a, a condition when I was walking with God. I think for many of us, revival is difficult because we feel like we can't come back to God. And, and there's one thing the devil does is he steps in and he reminds us of our past. Whether your past was last night, whether your past was just weeks ago, or if you're like, listen, it was 30 years ago, but there's so many skeletons in that closet, if it were to come out, I could fully stock a Halloween store, right? You say, if, if people knew who I was, if you found, no, no. And, and the devil knows those skeletons. He knows those things in your past. And maybe you sit here Sunday after Sunday, day after day, Maybe week after week you open up the Bible or you try to listen to worship and, and you want so bad to either connect with God or come back to God or, or get on board. And, and yet the devil steps right in, right in that moment of worship and whispers in your ear, who do you think you are? Don't you remember what you did? People will know who you were, the mistakes that you made. I want you to hear this morning from the life of Samson. That I want you to hear this lesson right here. Failure is an event, not a person. So many times when we fail, the devil whispers it in the ear that the, that the failure was us and not an event. And so the devil keeps that failure in our mind. And so we think there's no way God can use me. There's no way. If people found out, there's the, and you sit here Sunday after Sunday, week after week, moment after moment, trying your best to get close to God and come back to Him. Failure is an event, not a person. Here's what we learned from Samson this morning. Here's what I want you to gain. Samson's life reveals... How God can use our imperfections to fulfill His purpose. If you say this morning, I, I'm just too weak, you're exactly who God is attracted to. If you say, I don't have my act together, you're exactly who God's attracted to. There's no way God can use me, you're exactly who God is attracted to. He said, there's, there's no way I could ever fulfill this. You are exactly the type of person God is looking for. So this morning, we want to deal with the idea of failure. We want to deal with the idea of being able to come back to God. And revival for some of you this morning may mean, and I pray, the realization that God can use me. That despite who I may think I may be, what I may have done, what did happen, what others might think, God can use me and wants to use me. So I want us to learn five powerful lessons from the life of Samson. Okay. So I'm just going to begin reading in Judges 13. I'm only going to read just a few verses and we'll stop about halfway through a conversation that an angel has with the father of Samson. And then like I said, I'll mention some of the other details that are found in numerous chapters. I'm not going to go through the details of his calling and his acts, but I want to use those events in Samson's life to highlight five powerful lessons. Judges chapter 13. And the people of Israel again, I, I like the way that starts. It's almost like, really? Come on. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. There was a certain man named a man of Zorah of the tribe of Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born child, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and, I did not, and he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean for the child shall be called a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come once again and teach us 
what it is we are to do with this child who will be born. I want you to listen to verse 9. If you're ever a mom and a dad and you're praying for a, a son or a daughter to come to God or to do the right thing, understand this, God answers your prayer. And God listened to the voice of Manoah. I love that. I, I love it so much I underlined it. And the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. Let's stop there. We, from here we sort of get into the conversation that the father has with the angel. And then they learn how they're to raise the son. And from there, uh, Samson is announced that he is born. And, and he then begins his ministry and his marriage and then his downfall and then how God uses him. But this one, I want us to learn five powerful lessons. How are we just like Samson? Number one, we like Samson are called to live a holy life. Now this morning, you may not be a Nazarite. God may not have called you to never cut your hair. God may not have given the other Nazarite vows in which there were plenty of them to never touch a dead body and so forth. Like that. But listen, you may not be Samson, you may not be a Nazarite, but every one of us in Christ are called to live a holy life. You are just like Samson. You are to be set apart. So when the Bible calls you and I to be holy, the word holiness literally means to be set apart, to be set aside. It doesn't mean that the, the moment that we come to Christ, that we just go and hide in a cave somewhere. It doesn't mean that we isolate ourselves from the world. No, as a matter of fact, the moment we come to Christ, it means we insulate ourselves from the, the influence of the world, but we infiltrate the world with our salt and light. Interesting to note here that the word Samson, the name Samson means like the sun. In other words, it means to, to shine as a light. Isn't that interesting that you are just like Samson? You, you may not have the name Samson. Your name may not mean like the sun, but you have the same call. And that is to be a light, to be salt, and to be a light in a world that is dark. Now, we already went over this. Samson had a, a special calling and a special consecration. So do you. The moment that you, that you were born into this world, okay, hang on, hang on. You, you do realize that when God looked over the demographics of the world, that God just didn't populate the world by saying, I'm missing some short people, I'm missing some tall people, I'm missing people with green eyes, I need more brown eyes. I, 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 you know. God, God didn't just fill the demographics of the population by height and weight and size and color. You understand that, right? When, he got, when God created you, He specifically created and crafted you for a particular purpose in life. Number one, He created you so that you would eventually come to Him and have a relationship with Him. Number two, He created you so that no matter what you do, no matter if you work at Taco Bell or you're an astronaut, doesn't matter. no matter what you do, you have a purpose that God has called you to live out in your life. Please don't, under, don't misunderstand this. You are not a carbon copy in life. You, you are an original. You have been originally created by God, called by God, crafted by God, created by God to live out His purpose for your life. Yes. You, just like Samson, have a special calling. And you have a special consecration. You may not know that. You may think that special calling is only for pastors, only for ministers, only for missionaries, uh, only for deacons, only for people like that in the church. It's for every one of you. You understand that? It's everybody that God ever created. God created and fashioned them to have a particular purpose to live out in life. I say this often, but maybe I haven't said it recently. What you do pays your bills, but who you are is a minister in Jesus Christ. You, 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 one, day when you, one day when you get to heaven, God's not going to say, all right, entrance into heaven is how much you sold. You know, how big a house did you have? How much money you got in the bank? Oh, you're good. Come on in. That's not your, your basis of your entrance in heaven. Your entrance in heaven is obviously based upon your confession of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life and then living out that faith. So when you stand before God one day, you're going to give an account of how you lived out the purpose for which he created you. What you do pays your bills, and God wants you to have a job. But what you do pays your bills, but who you are is a minister in Jesus Christ. You were created to shine like the sun or to reflect the sun. You were created to be salt and light in a world that's full of darkness. You and I have the same calling as Samson, and it's to live a holy life. We have a special calling in our life. and So let me deal with a specific issue of Samson's to be good to the text. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink or... Oh, yeah. There you, thank you so much. There we go. No, I think that's... I think, is that 1 Corinthians 6, 17 through 18? That's it. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Now watch. This was Samson's specific sin. Flee from sexual immorality. 
Every other sin as a person commits, now watch, is outside the body. But watch this. But the sexually immoral person commits sin against the body. So we have, to, we have to address this because it's in the life of Samson. We know what his weakness was. His weakness was immorality. His weakness was, was women. We know that his, his weakness was the sins of, of sexual sins. So understand this. Let me say this lovingly, but let me say it strong. You need to get pornography out of your life. Get it off your phone. Get it off your computer. Get it out of your head. Get it out of your heart. Get it out of your house. And you say, well, it's, I don't do soft pornography. Watch the television shows that you watch. Get it out of your heart and get it out of your mind. It's not just a sin that's outside the body. It's a sin that's inside the body. The next passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? I've heard people say that have been married. Oh, well, pornography is there to help our marriage. No, it doesn't. It helps nobody's marriage. Get that stuff. Get that immorality out of your life. It's not. It damages you when you watch that, when you take part of that, when you view that. The Bible is strongly telling you and I, we have the same calling to live a holy life. And in this area of sexual sin, make sure you take care of yourself and protect your heart, protect your mind, protect the body that is a temple of the Holy Spirit. We have the same calling. It's a calling to live a holy life. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, do not be conformed to this world. Now stop for a minute. Let me dissect this verse for you. So when I first read this, the very first three words stand out to me. Do not be. Obviously what those words are saying to me is, there's something out there that wants to conform me. So when the, the Bible isn't saying, like, don't step out in the street. The Bible is saying stuff like, you know, don't eat too much pizza. It's not that. It's not warnings. The Bible is saying, do not be. So in other words, what this tells me right off the bat is there's something out there that wants me to be something other than God wants me to be. So revival may just mean coming back to God for some people. So the Bible is automatically telling you, understand this. There's something out there. There's a philosophy that is against the kingdom of God that wants you to conform to something other than the kingdom of God. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Now read this next part with me. By the... Where do the battles in living for God often start? Where do the battles on staying on your diet start? Am I the only one that's ever said, I'm not going to eat something, and all of a sudden I see it everywhere? Right? You're like, I, what is going on? The Bible, now watch, watch, watch. Do not be, how am I not conformed by the renewal of my mind? What does it mean for my mind to be renewed? Listen, your mind can't be renewed if it's full of images, anything other than God. You, you, you must have a clear mind to have a clear heart so you can have a clear light so it will obviously shine. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal constantly like fresh water running through and cleansing. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God. So this tells me there's a philosophy out there that wants me to conform to something than what is of God. The way that I am not conformed to that is keeping my mind constantly stayed on God, knowing that every day there's going to be tests that will check my discernment so I am on the will of God. So ultimately it tells me the reason why I'm not to be conformed is there is a purpose for God in my life. God has a purpose in my life that I am to live out every day. And when I am renewing my mind, I am staying the course of the will of God, not conforming to this world. Conforming to this world means so much more than don't look like it, act like it, talk like it, and dress like it. It means don't be robbed of the purpose of God in your life. Because that purpose of God is what is good and acceptable and perfect. In other words, you just won't feel critical, you won't feel angry, you won't feel cantankerous because that's the way you and I are wired. We are wired by God to live out the will of God. And whenever I'm not living out the will of God, things aren't connecting. And when things don't connect, we kind of get frustrated, right? The Bible says, let this happen in your life. So let me put it this way. We are Christians. If you've given yourself to Christ, we are Christians. We are not just Christians during church services. And that is such the temptation, is it not? Can I just confess to you that one of the easiest things to do in the world is to do what we're doing right now? Sit here among like-minded people, like-minded faith, and we need that. We know that. The Bible says it is through the church that God will make known the manifold wisdom of God. What you're a part of right now is, is the hope of the world, the local church. But it's the easiest thing in the world right now to live like a Christian in this environment. The hardest thing in the world is to leave here and go do it at work on the highway, 
in stores, in your marriage, in the dark, in the quiet. Listen, we are Christians, but we are not just Christians during church services. The life of a Christian is a life of overcoming. It is not a life of conforming. That is the life you and I are called to. Somebody said this, and let me read it. Any dead fish can swim down a river, but it takes a live and strong fish to go against the current. In the same way that it takes an active, zealous, and faithful Christian to go against the influence of this world and eventually be a part of God's kingdom. Anybody can float downstream. Anybody can go with the flow. Anybody can coast. But you and I as Christians, as followers of Christ, are called to swim against the current. You and I are called to swim upstream, not down. We are called to live a holy life. We have the same calling as Samson. Number two, learn this. God can use bad experiences to fulfill His purpose. I know If I know anything about you, it's because I know it about me. I've got things in my life looking back at it. If you've been around long enough and you heard my testimony, listen, I wasn't like a bad kid growing up. I mean, well, I'll let you determine what bad is when I share it with you. Anyway, I wasn't a bad. I, I tried smoking but had asthma. I couldn't do it. I mean, my first cigarette I thought I was going to throw up. I barely, I barely got through two puffs. I don't like the taste of alcohol. I understand how people do it. I know some people do it. But it tastes like drinking aqua velva or something like that, which I had to drink, by the way, in the Marine Corps. I don't understand that, okay? I don't get it. I don't get all that. So my idea of, of doing bad things was like egging people's houses on Fridays or something like that or, you know, pumping the BB gun once and shooting them in the back of the leg kind of a thing. Don't. I said, don't. Is this being recorded? This one's, right? Okay, so I wasn't, I mean, I, I wasn't a bad kid. I wasn't so, but when I, when I got out of high school and went into the Marine Corps, came out of the Marine Corps later, ran into a lot of my friends, and they were like, hey, man, good to see you. What are you doing now? I'm like, well, I'm a, I'm a pastor. They're like, huh? I mean, I wasn't a bad person, but even they were like, you know, what? What do you? I mean, it's not that we would have, wouldn't have thought that, but what's going on? Every, my point isn't all that. Every one of us have things in our past. We have closets. We have mistakes. We have events that have happened in our life. Even God can even use those bad experiences in your life. But hang on. You do understand this, right? The devil wants to come in and capitalize on those bad experiences and try to convince you and I that it's because of that God can't use you. It is because of that. That you have a testimony. It is because of that that you can demonstrate the power of grace, the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of mercy. It is because of those things that God is using you. Now, maybe a shocker here this morning. You understand nobody here this morning is perfect. Raise your hand if you've never made a mistake. If you're totally perfect and not in need of a Savior. (laughs) No No one here is perfect. But the devil wants to come in and convince you and demonstrate to you, yeah, you, really? I'll never forget when I was called into ministry and the first lesson I taught the students, man, the devil hit me so hard. It's like, really, Ron, you're not much older than them, and really, you people, no, you, you, no. I know every Sunday when I preach, I know what happens. The Holy Spirit speaks into your life, and you want to live for Him, you want to do things, but the devil steps right in and goes, you? No. You stutter, you're nervous, you're, you won't, you're not committed, you won't follow through. I know if people knew who you were and what you've been through, the church can't use you, the church needs somebody else. I know exactly the voice that happens in your life. I know the voice that happens in your head. I know the voices you hear in your heart telling you that who you are and what you've been through, God can't use it. Let me walk through the life of Samson in three statements. And then we're going to build upon that uh, for the rest of the message. When we say these bad experiences, here's the three things that summarize his life. He disregarded his parents. He disobeyed God, which ultimately dulled his spiritual senses. Now, if there are any teenagers out here, and by the way, pray for them. And kiddos, up, our teenagers are leaving for camp. They're going to drive through the night, going to Gatlinburg, get there about 1 o'clock tomorrow, check in. So pray for them to have a good camp as they head out this week. But... Um, For you teenagers, listen to me. There's a reason why in Exodus chapter 20, part of the Ten Commandments, it was given to honor your father and your mother. Because listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Speaking to someone who used to be a kid, who's now a parent, please listen to me. The moment you begin disregarding your parents, the next step is to disobey God, which you'll dull your spiritual senses. If there's ever a lesson you can learn from Samson as a kid, listen to mom and dad. Respect and honor your parents. Disrespect for authority means you won't listen to the authority of God. And you'll begin to disobey God. And as soon as you begin to disobey God, your spiritual senses become dull. What happens when your spiritual senses are dull? You are conformed to this world because you can't renew your mind. 
You and I must understand that God will use these bad situations to fulfill His purpose. Understand this. and Let me sit on this one for a while, okay? God's purpose for our lives is so much greater than our greatest mistakes. You have to get this, okay? You, you have to understand this. Now, let, let me hone in on this. God's purpose for our lives is greater than our greatest mistakes. I, I, I know three things in my life, and you know, you've heard me say this. I said it last Sunday. I know three things in my life that are bedrock convictions on my life that keep me where I'm at. Because I have the same mental struggles as you do. I have the same personal, emotional, spiritual struggles as you do. Just because I have the little title pastor in front of my name doesn't mean I'm better than you. No, no, no. It's me. I'm just the same as you. It just, this happens to be my calling in life. Get this. Understanding what God's purpose is in my life overwhelms and overrides all of my greatest mistakes. Three things I am bedrock assured of in my life. Number one, I know that I'm a Christian. I can remember the day that God saved me. I can remember Him speaking to my heart. I know that Jesus Christ is what I needed. Number two, I can clearly remember the day I felt called into ministry. And I'd never give ministry a thought in my life. I was either going to, I was going to be a Marine and come out and be a state trooper. I was going to be a Marine and come over and take care of my dad's construction company. Those are the only two options I had. Never once did I ever think about going into ministry. And number three, I am convinced that Raina is the wife I was supposed to marry because she is called to be a pastor's wife. Three things I am convinced of in my life is my salvation, my calling, and my marriage to Raina. And those things, those three things right there keep me, why do I share that about me? Because every, almost every day and every moment and, and definitely every weekend, the devil comes into my heart and my head. Who do you think you are to go preach? Who do you, who do you think you are to share that? The thoughts you've had, the emotions you... Who, who do you think you are to stand up and talk about being married? You and Raina just had an argument. And make, understand this. I've only been wrong twice in my marriage. <laughs> just kidding. Thought I had to keep you guys awake. Ron and Raina have arguments. We're human. And the devil comes in and says, Hey, who do you think you are to serve God? When I understand what the purpose of God is in my life, the calling of God, the purpose of God will always override my greatest mistakes. You need to get this. You're going to make mistakes in your job. You're going to make mistakes in your marriages. You're going to make mistakes in relationships. You're going to make mistakes with money. You're going to make mistakes on the computer and emotional and spirit. You're going to have slip-ups. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. But it's only understanding the purpose of God that gets you back up when you fall. What you do pays your bills, but who you are is a minister in Jesus Christ. If your only goal in life is to be a good boss or a good employee, when you fail, you've lost everything. If your only mission in life is to be a good person or a good husband or a good wife, you're going to fail at those. And if that is your only purpose, then that mistake will destroy you, right? But when you understand that my purpose is in following God, and when God says, I have chosen the weak things of the world, I have chosen the foolish things of the world, you can say, sign me up because I just made some mistakes. I'm, I'm weak. I'm foolish. If that is you, if you understand what your purpose is in God, bigger than your job, Bigger than your marriage, bigger than your finances, bigger than your, your, your accolades and accommodations and awards, bigger than all of that. If you understand that my life is called to serve God, then when those mistakes are made and the devil wants to step in and say, who do you think you are? You can say, you're exactly right. I know who I am because I am found in Christ. And if I weren't found in Him, you are exactly right, devil. These things would eat my lunch. But God has already described my life to be this. So this only helps me understand that. This is why you must understand what the purpose of God is in your life. Because you will fail, you will trip, you will stumble, you will make mistakes. And you know, as soon as you fall on the ground, the devil sits right down beside of you and says, Told you. And if that's all your purpose in life is, it will destroy you. God uses bad situations to fulfill his purpose. We have to mention this. It's a tough lesson. Number three, it's about the life of Samson. But we have to realize it. We do reap what we sow. Now listen, let me say this over and over. You and I can never be sinless, but we can sin less. Okay? But you and I are going to make mistakes. We, we are going to make bad choices. But understand this. God has set in motion this immutable law. The, what we reap, uh, we'll sow what we reap. 
He has set into to, to motion this, this immutable spiritual law. If you choose to break the law of God, bad consequences will follow. Though God can forgive you, the consequences of your actions will still affect you. Now that's true for all of us. Some consequences you'll be able to outlive and outlast. Some will, you know, be there. This, you, you and I need to understand this. You have to understand this because knowing that helps us to sin less. It helps us to make better choices. It helps us to why. I think nowadays, you know, looking at it, I think it's, it's harder to, to grow up a, a kid and a teenager nowadays. Can I just speak from the social media platform? I mean, you know, can, can you just imagine if all the pranks I ever played as a kid were put on social media? Now, you do know, kids and teenagers, you, you do know right now that your employer looks back from the first day you were on social media. They look back at your social media footprint and can choose to give you a job or no longer employ you at that job based upon what you put on social media. You know that, right? So remember, remember the days when, you could, when there was no caller ID and you could call prank people on Friday and they had no idea what phone number? Anybody remember that? As soon as caller ID came out, I was like, what am I going to do on Friday night for three hours now? You know, I don't know what. I mean, can you imagine everything you've ever done is put on social media and a, an employer looks back at that? Think about that. The Bible is telling us, whatever I put on social media, listen, you think, you think I can even go in and edit it. You do know that Facebook even has an edit history. Did you know that about Facebook? That if you go in and edit a post, notice the three little dots. You can put, click on somebody's post, click on the three dots, and you can do edit history. You can even see if they've edited what they've said. Wow, look at that. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a setting, but you can look at it. You can't even erase your past. Only God can cover your past. But the devil will be sure that he can remind you of that. So you and I need to keep this in, you may say, I don't believe in gravity and go jump off a building like I've said so many times before. You're not going to defy gravity, you're only going to demonstrate it. You're not, you may not believe in this immutable spiritual law, but the Bible says we will reap what we sow. You're free to choose the kicks, but not the kickbacks. You're free to make choices, but you're not free to choose the consequences. Here's why. Okay, let, let, can we spend a few minutes here? Let, here's why. Have you ever noticed that sin never starts out small? I mean, sin always starts out small. Have you ever noticed that? But it never ends small. It's just one hit. It's just one drink. It's just one comment. It's just one mistake. It's just one thought. It's just one outburst of anger. It's just one lustful look. It's just, it's just one affair. Have you, ever, you ever noticed sin always starts out as small but never ends small? That's the devil's joke in our life. It's just one. It's just one. It won't hurt. Nobody's looking. It won't affect anything. You need to know that no matter how small sin starts out, it never ends small. We always reap what we sow. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. God, the Bible says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Don't think in your mind that you're snowing God. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will reap. Even if you live in the remotest part of the world and nobody's around for 100 miles... God's still watching. You need to know that. And it's all about character. That's what we're talking about here. Because that's what the devil wants to attack in your life. So understand this. And this applies to every one of us here. Every action that you and I take will either bring us closer to God or take us farther from Him. Everybody in here this morning is either one decision away from following God or one decision away from walking away from God. That's every one of us. Right? Every day I get to wake up and make nothing but decisions on that day. Trust and obey or walk away. Right? You and I need to understand that, that law when it comes to for, uh, learning about Samson's life. Here's number four. Here's the fourth powerful lesson from the life of Samson. And you have to mention it. Choose your spouse wisely and spiritually. Choose your, wife, your spouse, husband, wife, wisely and spiritually. So we learn from Samson that not even his own parents didn't want him to, to marry this girl. So listen to this. We have seen in the life of Samson the tragic consequences of his decisions. He decided to choose a mate from, Tim, from the land of Timnah. A woman, watch this, from the daughters of the Philistines. The parents of Samson saw the foolishness of his choice and told him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren? Or among all of my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? Once again, his parents are coming to him trying to speak wisdom into his life. You need to understand this. We're going to do a family series coming up soon in the fall. Can't wait for it. So excited. And this will be one of the things we spend more time on. 
But for those of you that are unmarried, all right, you need to make sure you choose your wife, spiritually and wisely. And I'll tell you, if you've heard my testimony, my decision to, to, to dance around the dance floor with my wife wasn't spiritual at the moment. I saw how good she looked on that dance floor, and I said, she is somebody I need to know. Of course, you need to be attracted to the person you're getting missed. But you need to make sure that you choose your spouse wisely and spiritually. Why, well, here's what the Bible says. Listen to the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and 16. Do not be unequally yoked. Now watch with unbelievers. Let me, let me pause for a moment. Even if you do get married and you're both followers of Christ, most of the time there may be some things you're still working out. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean that she's a believer and he's a believer, but you're still working some things out, right? Now, yes, it can mean that you're of different faiths, you know, if you will. And sometimes some, some faiths are so opposite of each other that they just don't work out. It does mean that. But here, literally, it's talking about don't have a saved person marry an unsaved person. So let me tell you this. Missionary dating seldom, if ever, works. Do you know what missionary dating is? Missionary dating is, well, I'm a Christian and he's not. Maybe I can be a light in his life and he'll come to Christ. It has worked, but very seldom does it. Missionary dating is, again, just the opposite. Well, she, you know, she is so good looking and she's so pretty. You know, I can't see my life without her. She's not a Christian, but man, she's pretty. Maybe if I, I'll be a salt and light to her. Maybe this pretty girl. Well, look, missionary dating, dating seldom works. Because what happens is, is when you get married, now listen, I've seen it, I've seen it, I still see it to this day. I know this, I know this, I know this. Whenever you are spiritually unequal in marriage, whether it's the husband or the wife, if there's one spouse, that is a Christian, and they may not even be living 100% for God for whatever reason, maybe the environment of the home, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, trust me, over 25 years of watching this from the front row, whether one person is a Christian, where there's one person is a Christian, the other spouse in that house will be grumpy, critical, negative, hateful, bossy, argumentative, and rude. I'm just telling you right now, it'll be that way. And that house, why, why is that one spouse that way? Even if the other spouse isn't living for Christ, just because of the presence of God in that person, in that home, that person doesn't know it, but they're under such great conviction that it causes them to live that cantankerous sort of lifestyle. The Bible says it. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with dark? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? Watch the next part. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? There's one person in the house, 2 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? How does a temple of God get along, get along with temple of idols? It doesn't work under the same roof. Which is why that one spouse, that one person is so cantankerous. For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. You need to make sure that whomever you're marrying is of like faith. Because a temple of God and a temple of idols or a temple of reprobates or a temple of the unsaved, they don't dwell together under the same house. Learn that from the life of, of Samson. Number five, and here's where we close. We learn from Samson to use your strength for God's work, not my own will. Now, as I said earlier, you may not be Samson. There may have never been a time in your life where somebody declared you as a Nazarite. You may not have, have, have ever you know, said, don't take a scissors to your hair. You may have never taken a, a fresh jawbone of a donkey and slayed 3,000 people. You may not be Samson literally, but the Bible says use your strength for God's strength. Stop, stop for just a minute. Can you give me just a minute to explain this? For years, I have watched men and women who are so talented in business, so talented in the world. And, and, I'll, and I'll sit with, just, just give me 30 minutes just to sit with them. And I'll say, do you understand that what you're doing in the business world, that God didn't give you that just for, the biz, just for your employment and enjoyment. That how God has gifted you, what if you use those gifts in the kingdom of God? And they go, I've never thought about it that way. 
I've always just thought about it in terms of my employment or the skills that you're using. Yes, and God wants you to have a job and God wants you to use those skills. He wants you to use the strength that he's giving you for your employment and for enjoyment. Yes, God is not against that. But that's secondary to the primary purpose of God's calling on your life. What if God used those things that he's gifted you, those strengths in your life for you to use in advancing the kingdom of God? Have you ever thought about it that way? So make sure you use your strength for God's work, not my own will. Listen, as strong as Samson was, we know this. We must remember that his strength comes from God. Without God, he is as strong as any other ordinary man. That's you and I. That's you and I. Without the strength of Christ in our life, Philippians chapter 4, without the strength of Christ in our life, we're nothing. We're just as strong and as capable as anybody else that's not a follower of Christ. Our strength comes from God. As I've said over and over in this message, it is the purpose of God that overrides every bit of that. Please understand this. You are not a carbon copy in this world. You are an original made by God. And God crafted you. God created you. He crafted a purpose specifically for your life to live out. Never compare yourself to something. Comparison is the one thing that robs joy and confidence and security in Christ. You were not made to do somebody else's job. You were specifically created by God to finish the work that He's called you to finish. Which means this. Even in our moments of weakness, and we have them, God can still use us. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. First message I ever preached, August of 1988. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. When's the last time you heard somebody boast about their weaknesses? Now, I don't mean false humility. Like, hey, can you sing? Oh, no, I'm horrible. But they really can't. I don't mean false humility. I mean, when's the last time you heard somebody walk around going, man, I really stink at this and I'm proud of it. Right? That's, Paul, listen, listen to what Paul is saying. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. I like it that he personally... Paul could have said, my grace is sufficient for Paul. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. Watch, watch, watch. So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. There's a phrase that goes all the way through Samson's life. And the Spirit of God rested on him. And the Spirit of God rested on him. And the Spirit of God... Paul is a New Testament illustration of an Old Testament Samson. But Paul got it right. Maybe he... Studied Samson. Maybe he knew the mistakes Samson made. Maybe he learned from it. Instead of saying, I'm using my strengths, my strength to get what I want. He goes, everything about me. Oh, no, you got to go back. Everything about me. Oh, man. Oh, man. Everything about me is my weakness. It is my weakness. That is where I find my. That is where I boast. That is when Christ uses me the most. So that the power of Christ may what? Rest upon me. If you were totally honest this morning, you would admit you want and need the power of Christ resting on your life. Can I close with this? I've said this before, but let me remind you. Where you're sitting right now, there are three other people sitting in your seat. There are three people sitting where you're sitting this morning. One is the person that you are right now. It's the person that came in that door, discouraged, Excited, nervous, nominal. Where, wherever you are, there's the person you came in as this morning. Secondly, there's the person that you may be if you step away from walking with God. And then there's the third person, the person you could be when you walk with God. Now watch what happens. It happens every Sunday, which is why I give an invitation. Every Sunday, the devil steps in and speaks to the first two people. You know who you are. You came in here with no energy. You came in here with no desire. You haven't read the Bible in a while. You didn't recognize that worship song. You don't believe God answers prayer. You're discouraged about your job. Stay right where you are. Or he talks to the second person. Uh, No, don't follow that. Don't believe him. You know what you did last night. The person that you may be if you walk away. 
I'm asking you to let the Holy Spirit to the, speak to the one person that I know God wants to speak to, the person you could be when it comes to walking with God. I know from experience, because it happens every weekend of my life, if not every day, the devil steps in and wants to speak to the other two. Ron, you? Ron, you know what you did? I choose to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit that says, my grace is sufficient for you. Revival for every one of us means coming back to God. But for some of us, we don't believe we can come back to God because of the past or because of who we are right now or because maybe who we may be if we step away. Trust to believe in the God whose grace covers it all and follow him.